श्री गुरुभ्यो नम वक्रतुंड महाकाय सूर्यकोटी सभा निर्विघ्न कुरु मे देवाषु गुरु ब्रह्मा गुरुर्विष्णु गुरुर्देव महेश्वर गुरु साक्षात्ब्रह्म तस्म श्रीगुरवे नम तस्म श्रीगुरवे नम नमस्ते फ्रेंड्स टीम परम वेदांता वेलकम्स यू ऑल फॉर द गिफ्ट सेशन 26 लास्ट क्लास वी हैव कंप्लीटेड द वर्सेस फ्रॉम 6.7 टू 6.13 टुडे वी विल बी कंटिन्यूइंग द वर्सेस फ्रॉम 6.18 ऑनवर्ड्स आवर टुडे स्पीकर्स आर मिस्टर अमिताभ सहरा डॉक्टर चंद्रकला श्रीमती नीलिमा श्रीमती सोनिया नायक and shrimati triveni today's moderation and presentation by dr komal sir over to you sir sada shiva samarambham shankaracharya madhyamam asmadacharya padyantam vande guru paramparam today's session of sixth chapter focuses mainly on meditation the way meditation is done what is meditation what it is not so we have gone through this portion on meditation sometime earlier too and now we have realized what is meditation what is not so we'll recapitulate in the next few slides to see what is meditation what it is not we know for sure that meditation is not a means of liberation it's a very important lesson we have learned till now is that meditation dhyana is not a means of liberation liberation is not a goal to be accomplished at all even though we talk so much about moksha it's not to be seen as a goal to be accomplished it's like a it's not like a sadhya vastu anything which is a goal in time and we try to strive to achieve it it's a sadhya vastu whereas liberation is a siddha vastu it is our own intrinsic nature which is always there liberation is a siddha vastu it is not sadhya and since moksha is already accomplished fact it's only a matter for owning up or knowing it therefore Upanishads very clearly say, knowledge alone is the means of liberation. Meditation is not a means of liberation. Knowledge alone is the means of liberation. That is jnana. But again, even though we say knowledge alone is the means of liberation, even this knowledge, jnana. it just reveals the fact that liberation is an already accomplished truth it knowledge by itself does not accomplish liberation so meditation is not to gain knowledge also okay it's a means meditation is not a means of liberation knowledge alone is the means of liberation but even this knowledge it does not accomplish liberation for us it just reveals knowledge reveals the fact that liberation is an already accomplished truth so to summarize we need to always keep in mind meditation is important but it's not a means for liberation meditation is no, and knowledge is not the way to accomplish the liberation knowledge is against just the means and meditation is not to acquire that knowledge too 
And meditation, definitely we are sure that it's not for mystic experiences. I sat in meditation, my mind went blank. I got some uh, vision of a light which came from nowhere. It circled around my head. There was a kind of feeling in my head. So these are the mystic experience which we may get, but that's not the purpose of meditation. So that's not the reason why we meditate. So then what are the roles of meditation? So when we talk about Vedantic meditation, it fulfills two roles at two stages in our spiritual path. First is Upasana, second one is Nididhyasana. Upasana Dhyanam is the preparatory stage, preparation for spiritual knowledge, preparation of the mind for spiritual knowledge. So that's even before or at the start, when we start Shravanam under a Guru for a length of time. So that is when for the preparation, it's called Upasana Dhyanam. And then after a length of time, when Shravanam, Mananam, the knowledge is instilled into our minds, then comes the work of transformation of our personality. And that's when it's called Nididhyasanam. That's the second role of meditation. Once after Shravanam and Mananam comes Nididhyasanam. That is for transformation of personality. It's for an alert living. Always like riding a bicycle, how we balance every moment with that our uh, Nididhyasanam keeps God or keeps our supreme uh, real understanding of our own selves as the center of gravity and then we'll be alert of that fact every moment of our life. And second one is Atma Dhyanam, meditation, keeping our own self in mind. So these are the next stage which will help after Shamanam and Mananam, the Nididhyasanam stage, which will take us towards transformation of, the pers of our own personalities. So what are the stages for this meditation? Very important. So many times we get this question, how to meditate? What are the stages of Vedantic meditation? So we follow Patanjali's uh, Ashtanga Yoga for the purpose of taking us to the stages of Vedantic meditation. So we know uh, Ashtanga Yoga of Patanjali, it has Patanjali's Yoga Sutras has a theory component as well as the practical aspect of it. For Vedantic meditation purposes, we as it is take the practical aspect of it, the stages of it, because it very well suits the Vedantic meditation. So what are the stages of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras? We have seen uh, earlier, Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara. And the next three stages are the uh, focus of today's session, Dharana, Dhyana and Samadhi. In Yama, Niyama, the don'ts and do's, the ten commandments we have seen, Ahimsa, Satyam, Ashtayam, that is non-stealing, Brahmacharyam, Aparigraha, that is not possessing too much. So these are the Yamas to avoid, don'ts. And Niyamas are Shaucham, Santosha, Swadhyaya, Tapa and Ishwara Pranidhanam. So these are the part of Kriya Yoga or Karma Yoga in other words. They are the Niyamas. These are the do's, what we need to follow. So this 5 plus 5 makes us a moral, gentle, a decent or an ethical, a refined person. These are the Bahiranga Sadhanas which needs to be observed throughout the day, every day. Next comes Asana. Training oneself to sit in a posture for a length of time. This is to rein in or to disciplining our Annamaya Kosha. Next comes Pranayama, that is disciplining or regulating the breathing aspect, like engaging the mind. As Sri Ramana says, it's like Jala Pakshivat, to like engaging, to put our mind in a cage, using our breathing, disciplining our breathing. Outgoing mind is brought to our body, and then it's easy to go further. Next stage is Pratyahara. Withdrawal of our sense organs from external world, sense control, dhamaha in other words. This asana, pranayama and pratyahara are antaranga sadhanas. They are practiced just before meditation. The actual meditation starts 
then then comes 6 7 8 so these are the three stages dharana dhyana and samadhi what happens in dharana focusing focusing the mind on a chosen subject and what is the subject we choose in vedantic meditation my own higher nature chaitanyam and it's not easy to keep that focus continuously so once we bring it to focus then we need to retain that focus to retain that focus is called the stage of dhyana retaining the focused condition and the next comes samadhi absorption in that subject matter totally engrossed in that so that's the next stage so that comes uh, the with that we come to the eighth stage of uh, ashtanga yoga beyond that where we go when beyond these stages the next will be nirvikalpaka stage so that's where we want this ashtanga yoga to lead us further so these are the stages which we are going to study today the dharana dhyana and samadhi so we'll start with verse 18th of the uh, 6th chapter by shri amitabh sahay saha roy over to you sir. Hariyo, Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha, verse 6.18. Yada vinyatam chittam atmanyeva vatrishtate nishpraha sarva kamebhya yukta ichyutta te tada. Move to the next slide, sir. Yeah. Swami Paramathananda uses Patanjali's Ashtanga Yoga framework to describe how the meditation is done. So the first part of the chapter 6 from verses 1 to 17 that we have seen in the previous classes mm -hmm. talk about the disciplines to be followed uh, to in order to practice meditation. Two types of discipline are recommended as Dr. Komal sir just mentioned. They are Bahiranga Sadhana or the general disciplines like karma yoga, self-control, moderation, etc. And the second type of discipline is antaranga sadhana or the specific disciplines to be practiced just before meditation like posture, place and time of meditation. So now we come to the 18th verse and from the 18th verse onwards, Lord Krishna talks about dhyana sarupa or the process of meditation itself. The process of meditation, let's understand it, they have three stages. They are dhyan, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi, or focusing the mind, retaining the focus, and getting absorbed, or the union. We can move to the next slide. So let's dive into each one of them. Dharana to start with, which is stage one. So in dharana, the mind is focused upon the object of meditation. No other thought other than the object of meditation must be entertained. The mind is withdrawn from external objects. Mind has to be withdrawn from anatma, which means that the thoughts about our home, office, husband, wife, family, the world, the body, and the mind has to be withdrawn. It is called chittam vinyatam. Vinyatam means restraint. And this can happen only if we develop attachment from anatma or worldly objects. If we are governed by raga and dvesha, it is very difficult. Hence, the emphasis on the preparatory disciplines like karma yoga are very important in order to make our mind ready and prepared for meditation. We can move to the next slide, sir. Okay. Now comes the second stage of meditation, which is dhyana. So once we focus on the object of meditation, we have to retain the focus. We retain the focus or the flow of thought for a length of time and it involves effort. Mind may tend to divert away to some other thought. In that case, we need to bring back the mind gently and it requires practice. When it is done repeatedly, the mind will get into a groove. Through habit, one can retain the focus on the object of meditation. So now one may ask, what is the object of meditation? The object of meditation has to be God. Okay, it, has, it could be one's own Devata, like Lord Shiva, Lord Rama, or Lord Krishna. In Vedantic meditation, it cannot be thoughtlessness. It has to be thought related to God. Otherwise, it will just merely be an exercise in concentration and it wouldn't be called dhyana. 
So that is why dhyana is called uh, saguna brahma vishaya manasa viparaha, meaning mental activity associated with God. Okay, so now let's move to the next slide. Now let's go to the third stage of the samadhi. In samadhi, Lord Krishna says, yukta ichyuttate, meaning yoga or union. The mind is completely absorbed in the object of meditation. Let's take an example. For example, when we are watching a movie in a theater, in the beginning, we know that we are in a theater and they are projecting a picture on the screen. But gradually, as the movie progresses and it gets interesting, we tend to get absorbed. We forget the fact that we are in a theater and there is a screen and a picture. We become one with what is being shown. And if the protagonist of the movie rejoices, we are happy. And if she is in pain, we are sad. Okay, so the division entirely vanishes. And this is the state of the mind during Samadhi, when we are focused on the object of meditation, which is God. We are entirely one and we are absorbed. It becomes, uh, so we, we become entirely absorbed and one with the object of meditation. So this state is called the state of Samadhi. Haryom Om Sri Guru Namah. Thank you, Shri Amitabhaji. So nicely, uh, Shri Amitabha has summarized the three stages of Vedantic meditation. They are the dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. To recapitulate, dharana is focusing the mind on chosen subject. And for Vedantic meditation, the chosen subject is my higher nature. Initially, it can be ishtadevata. When we do at the upasana, uh, when we call it upasana, that's our ishta devata. So that's focusing the mind on any of our own ishta devatas. And as we progress to nididhyasanam, the focus becomes my own higher nature. That's chaitanya. And retaining that focus condition is dhyana and absorption in that subject matter continuously engrossed in that as. Uh, Amitabh Bhaji explained, giving an example of being in a cinema, seeing a movie, where we get engrossed. So that's the samadhi stage, engrossed in that subject matter. What's the subject matter? It's always Brahman, my own higher nature. So we'll go to the next verse, 19th verse, by Dr. Chandra Kala. Chandra Kala, please. Okay, uh, we are discussing Dhyana Swarupam in these verses. Verse 6.19 describes a true yogi who has mastered the art of controlling mind. Coming to 6.19 verse itself. Yata Deepo Nivatasto Ningate Sopamasprata Yogi no Yata Chittasya Junjato Yoga Matmanaha the following simile is mentioned for the restrained mind of a yogi who is practicing dhyana yoga, dhyana yoga of the atma. It is like a lamp in a windless spot where it does not flicker. When a lamp is kept in an open place, flame flickers because of disturbing breeze. The direction in which the light flickers is unpredictable. If we protect the flame from the breeze by providing glass enclosure, then, then flame is steady stick. In meditation, our thoughts are like a flickering lamp. Although our thought is on the object of meditation, some other thoughts take over meditative thought. We, we are not even aware that we, are, we have drifted. Lord Krishna says, this steady flame corresponds to nirvikalpa samadhi. At this state, Atma-related thoughts are not disturbed by anatma-related thoughts. That is, akandakara vritti atma is not disturbed by anakara vritti. Our worries are because of our inability to face both the actual and the imaginary future. The imaginary future tends to be more disturbing. Attachment is the second source of disturbance where one worries about his or her own dear ones. When enclosure, what enclosure can I give to the mind to maintain steadiness? Vairagya, that is detachment. Vairagya, that is detachment. And bhakti, that is devotion. 
these are the two enclosures that one can provide the mind to protect it from disturbances coming to word coming coming to the words meaning now yatha deepo nivatasto as a lamp which is placed in a windless place remain unflickering ningate sopa masprata does not flicker this is a simile that is used for restrained mind yogi no yatha chittasya to describe the controlled mind of yogi that is disciplined mind what does disciplined mind do yunjato yogam atmanah this mind is engaged in atma dhyanam in the next few verses dhyana palam has been defined thank you sir thank you dr chandrakala we saw that when the perfectly controlled mind rests in the self and only in the self free from longing for all other objects and desires then that's a stage of being in yoga yukta he is united and uh, she nicely explained the simile of a lamp which is placed in a windless spot and that will bring the, the focus so that's the, the yogi that's the restrained mind of a yogi and once we get into that dhyana in the next further verses we get into the portion where we see what is the definition of dhyana what will happen in the uh, meditation what will there in the following verses we see there are seven sort of definitions which will define a successful meditation so we will see in the further slides so first thing will be to get a tranquil mind chitta uparam the next is atma darshanam one perceives the atma with a pure mind and rejoices in the atma the next further we see the next definition the third definition which is it takes us to limitless ananda okay one should know that to be in samadhi we can appreciate one can appreciate that limitless ananda which is beyond sense organs and which is grasped by the intellect okay and then once reached there that he gets established in his one's own real nature that's being tatva nishta like right? uh, somebody who has learned say uh, riding a bicycle and how he gets that limitless joy when he realizes nobody is holding the cycle and he is on his own and is able to balance continuously he won't slip down from his that nature of balancing so that's the next definition and then further two definitions will be about atyantika labha so it's like there is no more uh, you would think of possessing once you get there so there is there's nothing else you can think of attaining so one does not consider any other attainment to be superior to what he has already got there and remaining in which one is not shaken even by any great dukkha or sorrow or calamity so these are the further definitions which we'll be seeing in the following verses and in the to start those definitions shrimati nilima will take us through verse 20 jay gurudev let us see verse 20 from verse 18 to 32 krishna talks about dhyana swarupam and dhyana phalam dhyana swarupam is the process of meditation mind dwelling upon a chosen object it is not retaining the mind but it is directing the mind to the subject matter which one have learned from the scriptures that the body sense organs mind they all are, are instruments which are not real i and my higher nature is very chaitanya the conscious principle which is aware of all instruments dhyana phalam the greatest benefit of this is perspective change sarvatra samadarshana which leads to freedom from raga and dvesha in the verse 23 lord krishna defines yoga as nirvikalpa samadhi 
absorption of a Vedantic meditator and from verse number 20 to 23, Krishna gave seven descriptions of Samadhi. In the present verse, we are going to see two descriptions. In 21st verse, another two descriptions and 22nd verse, another two descriptions. In 23rd, one more description. So total seven descriptions of Samadhi. In the first description, Chitta Uparama, mind is absorbed in itself. The second description of Samadhi is Atma Darshana. The one's mind is absorbed in Atma Darshana, owing up one's own higher nature. Third definition is Atyantika Sukham. One enjoys maximum ananda because I am seeing my own higher nature looking into a mirror. And then Tattvanista, being established in one's own real nature. Tattva is a fourth definition. Atyantika Lava. It is a stage in which one has attained highest in life. And Atyantika Dukkha Nivritti. It is a stage in which one has withdrawn from all the sorrows. And then finally, Krishna defined Dukkha Samyoga Viyoga. A stage in which a person is no more identifies the gain of Anatma. Let us chant the words. Yatro paramate chittam niruddham yoga sevaya yatra chaivatmanatmanam vashyanatmani tushyati Meaning, one should know that to be samadhi wherein the mind restrained by the practice of meditation quietens and wherein one perceives the atma with a pure mind and rejoice in Atma. In the present verse, we are going to see two descriptions of Samadhi. First de de description being Chitta Uparama. Nirvi Kalpaka Samadhi is a state in which the mind is totally withdrawn from Anatma. The second description is Atma Darshanam. It is a state in which the mind enjoys Atma Gnanam. Yatropa Ramate Chittam Niruddham Yoga Sevaya Yoga Anusthanena Chittam Uparamate The mind quietens, subsides because of Yoga Abhyasa. Yoga Abhyasa includes Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara. These are Bahiranga Sadhanas. Dharana, Dhyana Samadhi are Antaranga Sadhanas. Dharana Dhyana Samadhi is focusing, retaining and getting observed in the chosen subject. Yatra Chaivat Atmana Atmanam Pashyan Atmani Tushyati Sve Eva Atmani The Jeevatma sees the Paramatma in himself. So, the Atmanam means the Atma. Atmani means in the mind. With the help of the mind itself. Because the thought is involved. Without the Vedantic thoughts, there is no Vedantic meditation. Therefore, with the help of the mind, one would gain Atma Dhyanam, Atma Darshanam in the mind itself. In Nidityasanam, the advantage is one removes all other noises from the mind by Yoga Abhyasa. And then when one brings the scriptural teachings in Nidityasana, the teaching has got more impact. Atma is in the mind, resides in the mind as a witness of our thoughts. One who gains Atma Jnanam or Atma Darshanam, he rejoices in one's own higher nature as Atma. Jai Guru. Thank you, Srimati Nilima. Now, following the first and second definitions of uh, Vedantic meditation, we will go further to verse number 21, which will be explained by Srimati Soumya Nayak. Hariyo, Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha. Um, verse 21. Sukha matyantikam yatad 
बुद्धि ग्राह्यमतीन्द्रिय वेति यत्र न चैवायम स्थित चलती तत्व so as explained we have finished learning the first two uh, definitions so this verse will talk about the third and the fourth definition of nirvikalpa samadhi so in the next slide we will see the next slide sir huh? yeah the third definitions let's start off with atyantikam sukham so we'll go into these two words in detail in the next slide okay so what is atyantikam sukham so next slide atyantikam means limitless and sukham or ananda means fulfillment and this is totally different from the experiential sense pleasures all sense pleasures are finite in terms of time place quality and quantity so in terms of time so previous slide in terms of time one says i had an ecstatic bliss or he says now it's not there it was there then in terms of quality one can say that he sang so well the other day but he was inspired by some mood and that has not come back yet so this ananda is limitless if ananda is obtained in samadhi only then it is limited right so someone said when in samadhi i had the greatest bliss and when i came out it felt like a scorpion stinging so no one wants that right so in the next slide we see that this ananda which is born out of knowledge that is buddhi grahyam buddhi means intellect okay what kind of knowledge is this it is the knowledge that i am purnam i was purnam and i will be purna so this knowledge is permanent it cannot be displaced by time and it cannot be shaken by any worldly experience so this atyantikam sukham which is buddhi grahyam is ati indriyam which means that it is beyond all sense pleasures why because sense pleasures are definitely finite so the third definition that we learned of samadhi is atyantikam sukham so there is a verb in the next slide which is veti anubhavati that is what it means okay which it which is uh, purposely put in the second line and not in the first why is that because krishna is not using the words experiencing pleasure with the senses why is that so because this ananda is in the form of knowledge or wisdom and this brahmananda he enjoys by claiming as himself okay so in the next slide comes the fourth definition that is atmanishta yatra ayam sthitah na tatva chalati next slide it, this means remaining in or abiding in atma one does not deviate to anatma so next slide in the bhashyam uh shankaracharya has said that the meaning of yatra is yasmin kale and the word ayam means vidwan so shankaracharya by using the word vidwan says that he is not practicing nididhyasanam to attain gnanam but he is already a gnani sthitah means abiding in one's own true nature in the next slide we can see a beautiful analogy which komal sir has already given us an idea about okay you can see that man cycling there so when we learn cycling we first learn on an empty ground and we have to practice a lot and concentrate and then once we become a cycle nishta even if we ride on a busy street we will not fall so in the same way once a person practices this even during intense transactions of the day or during the worst life's crisis we will not deviate from this knowledge next therefore next slide sir so tatvatah tatva means atma chalati means deviate one does not deviate from the higher nature so next slide life what does it become it becomes just a drama and the person is supposed to identify his role in the drama and he knows what he has to play for example if it's a beggar in a drama he knows that he has to play that and he does not lose the awareness of his real nature in the next slide 
when I deliberately practice this previous slides, when I deliberately pre previous slides, uh, the cycle, yes. So when I de deliberately practice this, it is samadhi. But when I'm effortlessly like this, like the cyclist once has become a pro at it, this is called Sahaja Samadhi. The cyclist is riding without paying attention to the road. He is in Sahaja Samadhi. Sahaja Samadhi means remembering the teaching during worldly transactions. So here, the Jnani is the center of gravity himself. So last slide. So in these two verses, this is what we learn. Third definition and fourth definition of Nirvikalpa Samadhi, which is Atyantikam Sukham and Atmanishta. Thank you. Thank you, Srimati Soumya, for the wonderful explanation of Seva uh, 6.21, which showed the other two definitions uh, of uh, Vedantic meditation. We go further to verse 22, which will be explained by Srimati Triveni. Om Shri Guru Bhyon Namaha. Yam Labdhva Chaparam Labham Manyate Nadikam Tataha Yasmin Sthito Nadukkena Guruna Pivichalyate Having obtained this gain, he does consider anything superior than that, established in which he cannot be agitated by the heaviest of sorrows. One should know that to be in Samadhi, attaining which one does not consider any other attainment to be superior to that and remaining in which one is not shaken even by great calamity. In this verse, Krishna gives two more definitions. When a person owns up this Purnatvam of the Atma, that is, I am Purnaha, I do not lack anything in life, I do not need anything in life to be complete, and since I do not miss anything in life, whatever I enjoy because of my Punyam, they all will become a luxury in life. I do not need any one of them. When I do not need and I have got that, that is called luxury. What is the definition of luxury according to Paramarthananda Swamiji? Luxury is that which you enjoy when you have and which you do not miss when you do not have. Luxury is that which you thoroughly enjoy when available and you do not miss when it is not available. And what is need? Opposite of luxury is what need is. Need is that which you do not recognize when it is there and which you very badly miss when it is not there. When you do not have a car at all and you are used to auto, bus and all kinds of transport and one day somebody gives a lift, you thoroughly enjoy. You know next day walking or bus or whatever it may be, but you do not miss the car. You are used to whatever the transport you are used to and one day it comes, it is luxury. Somehow you regularly come. This is the difference between luxury and need. Luxury is that whose presence you enjoy, whose absence you do not miss. Need is that whose presence you do not recognize, whose absence you very badly feel. For a gnani, everything in life is a luxury. Every blessed thing in life is luxury. Therefore, when they are around, he will thoroughly enjoy. And when they are not, he is not going to miss it. Dayananda Swamiji talks about the sannyasis in Rishikesh. Sannyasis in Rishikesh live on bhiksha and there are a few institutions established by devotees who regularly give bhiksha to these sannyasis. It will be only two items, roti and dal, day and night. That is it. And they are used to that. That is what sannyasa ashrama is. And when there is a tourist season, Devotees go to the ashrama to give a special bhiksha. Once in a lifetime or once a year, some rupees and they call all the sannyasis and give them gulab jamun, puri and varieties of food. And they will really eat well and also they know that the next day they have to go back to roti bhiksha. This is called independence. So thus Krishna says, yam labdhva, having owned up this purnatvam, Aparam labham, 
all the other aims in life, all other accomplishments in life become what? Na adhikam manyate. They are not very great gains. They are avoidable. They are not needed gains. One can go without those gains also. Therefore, any other gain is insignificant. All other gains become insignificant in front of this accomplishment. And therefore, what is the fifth definition? Atyantika labaha. It is the highest gain in front of which all the other gains are insignificant. And then comes the sixth definition. Yasmin stitaha. Remaining in this atmanishtha, in this center of gravity, nature of oneself, na vichalyate. One is not shocked by or shaken by even the guruna api, even the worst tragedy in life, a state remaining in which one is not shaken by even the worst tragedy. Nothing is capable of shaking. Even if he asks what, after hearing some unfavorable news, next moment he says, so what? Because he knows all things in life are subject to just simple arrival and departure. Therefore, Guru Napi, even the worst sorrow, the heaviest sorrow, Guru Dukham, heavy sorrow, not the sorrow caused by the Guru. So here Guru is not a noun, it is an adjective. Even by the heaviest sorrow and therefore, Atyantika Dukhena Nivrati, total freedom from sorrow. In the material realm, no extent of attainment satiates a person totally. A poor person strives hard to become rich and feels satisfied if he or she is able to become a millionaire. But when that millionaire looks at a billionaire, discontentment sets in again. The billionaire is also discontented by looking at an even richer person. No matter what happiness we get, when we perceive a higher state of happiness, the feeling of unfulfillment lingers. But happiness achieved from the state of yoga is the infinite bliss of God. Since there is nothing higher than that, an experience that in an experiencing infinite bliss, the soul naturally perceives that it has reached its goal. God's divine bliss is also eternal and it can never be snatched away from the yogi who has attend, attained it once. Such a God-realized soul, though residing in the material body, remains in the state of divine consciousness. Sometimes eternally it seems that the saint is facing tribulations in the form of illness, antagonistic people, an oppressive environment. But internally the saint retains divine consciousness and continues to relish the bliss of God. Thus even the biggest difficulty cannot shake such a saint, such a yogi. Established in union with God, he rises above bodily consciousness and is thus not affected by bodily harm. Thank you. Dhanyavada. Thank you, Srimati Triveni, for a nice explanation, elaborate explanation of the fifth and sixth definitions of dhyana, that is Atyantika Lava and Atyantika Dukha So these are the, these are what, these are, uh, what are the benefits of this meditation? Uh, and in other words, these are the definitions, the very definitions of what meditation is about. So that's it about meditation, Vedantic meditation. So we saw six definitions today. So that is Chitta Uparama, uh, Uparama that is mind subsiding, absorbing within itself. That is like Manasa Sarovara Visa, total tranquility of the mind. And next is Atma Darshanam or Tattva Darshanam. One's own mind is absorbed in Atma Darshanam, owning up one's own higher nature. And next is Atyantika, Atyantika Sukham, enjoying maximum Ananda. This is experiential Ananda. Uh, this is beyond that happiness, what we get from our Vyavaharika plane. So that's the, the maximum happiness, Atyantika Ananda. And then Tattva Nishta, being established in one's own real nature. That was the fourth definition. And now we saw the fifth and sixth definition, Atyantika Labha. So that is beyond that, there is nothing, no other material possession will entice you once uh, you are there. And next is 
ಅತ್ಯಂತಿಕ ದುಃಖ ನಿವೃತ್ತಿ ಎ ಸ್ಟೇಜ್ ಇನ್ ವಿಚ್ ಒನ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ವಿತ್ ಡ್ರಾನ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಒನ್ ಇಸ್ ಫ್ರೀ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಆಲ್ ಸಾರೋಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದ ನೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಒನ್ ಕಮ್ಸ್ ದುಃಖ ಸಂಯೋಗ ವಿಯೋಗ ವಿಲ್ ಸಿ ಇನ್ ದ ನೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ವರ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ನೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಸೆಷನ್ ವಿಲ್ ಗೋ ಇನ್ ಟು ದಟ್ ಇನ್ ಡೀಟೇಲ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಅ ಸ್ಟೇಜ್ ಇನ್ ವಿಚ್ ಎ ಪರ್ಸನ್ ಇಸ್ ನೋ ಮೋರ್ ಐಡೆಂಟಿಫೈಡ್ ವಿತ್ ಅನಾತ್ಮ ಸೊ ನೋ ಮೋರ್ ಹಿ ಐಡೆಂಟಿಫೈಸ್ ವಿತ್ ಎನಿ ಕೈಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ದುಃಖ ಸೊ ಈಸ್ ಇಟ್ ನೌ ವಿ ವಿಲ್ just have some introspection on what does this mean is it just a exercise in linguistics we try to convince ourselves that all our sorrow will go away or how is it possible for the mind to take out all the sorrows is it really possible so this is where the two kinds of meditation and a kind of our doubts between how it is done because in um, some places we see the yogic meditation where the focus is more on the practice of meditation and here we are purely concentrating on the type of meditation which is which we call as vedantic meditation which swami paramarthananda takes us into vedantic meditation and the other meditation where we follow the practice or the theory aspect of patanjali yoga sutras will be slightly differing at a certain level so because we have reached a certain stage where we need to know these details we will keep some time to study what these differences might be so this was one meme which came in whatsapp a few months ago a bald person will come with a hair oil and gives an ad it was supposed to be a joke that he says so after i started using this hair oil my problem of hair fall has completely vanished so he says he i had problem of hair fall then after i started using this oil probably he lost all the remaining hair also and became bald and he never had that problem at all it was supposed to be a joke but this is something which we need to uh, think about uh, which will give us an answer about the different kinds of meditation and what's the purpose of meditation so suppose if our purpose of meditation is to take off the mind in the equation of being one with the supreme is it acceptable to us mind is our antahkarana mind is mind is our antahkarana mind is the one with which we know we have achieved something we know we have reached something every night when we sleep in the deep sleep stage we go to that stage of oneness but do we know we have actually reached there when our mind is off when our antakarana of the instrument in the instrument is absent you will not be able to know that gnana of reaching there won't be there so we can't take out the mind in the equation we need to keep the mind but we need to take out the sorrow is it really possible so recently we had yugadi what do we do in yugadi we take bevu bella the neem leaves and that jaggery mix it together and symbolically we represent our sorrows and the uh, Uh, good things to come in the coming year and we resolve ourselves that we take both of them in equal spirit and have them symbolically representing it's a inevitable mix of sweet and sorrow every day every year is like that the mind is the salad of sweet and sorrow so of sukha and dukha what do we call mind here is it the container of this uh, thing neem and jaggery or is it the content if we take out the neem from this we can't call it mind at all it is again the universal ananda which is there everywhere which will be open up which will be once that agnana is taken out it's just that pure ananda pure jaggery everywhere but can we call it mind and if we reach there do we know that we have reached there we can't 
So Swamiji gives a subtle explanation of four terms which we will try to understand today. One is guna and guni. So guna is a property. The property of neem is that bitter taste. And that neem is guni. They are interdependent. If we develop a species of neem in which it has zero bitterness, can we call it neem at all? We can't call it neem. Can we have something sugar which is not sweet at all? It's the essential nature of sugar is being sweet. If we take out that sweetness from that, if we take out that sweet guna from sugar, we can't call it sugar at all. These two are interdependent terms without which one without which does not exist, like heat and fire, bitterness and neem, sweetness and jaggery. So we want that to be there, but we don't want its effects to be there is not a possible solution. So looks like we can't have a solution in which we, realistically speaking, can take out all the sorrows by whatever knowledge we get. Yeah, that is when we think of mind in a certain plane. So we'll go to the next two words definitions, which is called adhyasa and adhishtana. So we all know the example of rope and snake. This is a different kind of example, different kind of situation in which the snake, even though it appears that it is superimposed on the rope, it is a kind of fallacy, an illusion which is created. And if you take out the snake, the rope can remain. I hope you notice the difference between the earlier two terms, guna and guni. This is not the guna. That adhyasa is not a nature, it's not a property of the rope. In certain situations, because of ajnana, it projects that idea of snake in the minds, in the dim limit atmosphere, like that. Okay. And when jnana comes, when we when that knowledge of this is just a rope comes, that whatever is in the adhyasa level, the snake disappears. When we realize that Adhishtana as the Atma, Brahman or Chaitanya, and Adhyasa is Anatma, everything else, including our mind, then we have a basis on which we can stand on firmly and say everything else is an illusion, including the mind, including the jaggery, including the name. Here, Ramana gives a uh, kind of solution about two kinds of uh, uh, sam samadhi. We heard about sahaja samadhi. Other term is called kevala samadhi. Where it is uh, to give an example that other uh, kind of samadhi is where like you are trying to take a bucket of water using a rope from a well. You, the rope is always in your hand. But when you dip it down, the bucket reaches the water, fetches some water, and you can lift it up. But the rope is always there. Unlike the situation in which a river enters the sea, which is irreversible, once happens, it is over. You can't come out and say that, oh, I have seen the ocean. Because we are bound in this body, we can just have that glimpse of that ocean like that bucket which just dips into the well and comes out. So this is the difference between two kinds of samadhis. So whereas in that actual Nirvikalpaka samadhi, the absolute one, once we reach, there's no coming back in the practical sense. Though uh, in a linguistic sense, we say we reach a point of once you see that, like the giraffe you see in the stereogram, once you see that, it's unable, it's impossible to not see it again. But still, we are hanging on with a rope. 
this is the subtle difference but uh, for the, it's like a mind is like that bucket which takes us there and to come out and say i saw that water that huge body of water in the well you need that bucket if you stay there you will not able to say or in case if you go there and come out without your knowledge like in yogic meditation like uh, uh, what we can say you like in deep sleep stage where you go to deep sleep or where you get uh, you get into some kind of medications or like anesthesia you go there you come back there's also oneness with the supreme but do you realize that you have actually gone there do you realize that this is a whole anatma the whole world around us is adhyasa that's the subtle difference in two kinds of samadhis which we need to realize now and now coming back to these two terms guna guni adhyasa and adhisthana guna and guni are the terms which we use for the mind and its guna saro is its guna we can't take out only saro and keep the mind but we need to understand that both this guna and guni at the mind level is at a different level of reality the level of adhyasa whereas adhisthana is different and we are aiming to touch that have a glimpse of that and come back inevitably because we are bound in this body and so this is the subtle difference as we reach higher and higher in this topic of meditation we need to get into this level of understanding without which we will pass it off as a past time which we just come as a hobby stay here and go back so this when we come to nididhyasana when we make it as a way of life it is not meditation is not practiced for few minutes or few hours in a day it is it alters it transforms us it transforms our personality of how we see life and how we see the world around us so we'll keep these examples in mind and uh, the focus of today's topic being meditation vedantic meditation to take home message for today three steps of vedantic meditation dharana that is focusing the mind on what on the chosen subject what is our chosen subject in vedantic meditation our own higher self and second is retaining that focused condition dhyana and then to come to samadhi to get engrossed absorbed in that subject matter of our own higher nature which is at a different plane of reality that's the adhisthana yeah, that is samadhi so that we, that we come to the end of today's session on meditation in the next class is we go to session 4 of important upanishadic mantras which will this time will be from munda kopanishad that will be on 17th of uh, may 2024 om purna madam purna mada purna mada purna midam purna purna mudachate purnasya purna madaya purna meva vishyasate om shanti shanti shanti